Hello everyone, welcome to episode number 18 in the scripting series. We are progressing along now at a good rate with these videos and I am trying my best to get as many out as possible to finish this series off. So for anybody requesting videos in the comments section, I will just say this now. I am currently focusing on the beginner videos and I will not be doing... Well, I probably will be doing some, but all of my efforts are going into this series at the moment, although I am working on many more projects, many more video series, which will be coming out soon. But this takes priority first, because it's been going on a while, and we need to get this series over with so we can get into the more advanced content. But doesn't mean that we're going to rush through anything, and today we're actually focusing on a topic that a lot of you have requested. I've been seeing in the comments, everybody's been asking for a tutorial on this because they can't find much about it anywhere online and it's quite confusing so don't worry you've come to the right place I'm going to explain everything you need to know about in pairs for loops all right so if you haven't learned about tables already and you're just stumbling on this video I do recommend you check out the previous video in this series episode number 17 I'll leave a link in the description all about tables because basically for loops are an extension from tables you need to know all about tables uh, because for loops are actually used on tables and they're, they're used to manipulate tables so this has no purpose or meaning if you have no clue about tables but luckily I made a video going through everything you need to know about tables and uh, that's what we will be basing this tutorial on today so going on from that video this is where we left it we left it at this example here where we have players who are in a round and we've just got Alvin Bob and Alan and we had a great comment question in from Lua programmer in the comments who said so what if we don't know the position of the value and want to remove it? Now this is a great question because right now, if we want to remove something from the table, if we wanted to remove, um, you know, Bob for example, we would have to give the index position value of that player. So we would have to say table.remove, we'd have to give the list which would be players in round, but then we'd have to say the number, so the, the position in the list where the player is that we want to remove. So in this case, it's Bob, and Bob's index is two, so we would remove him. Okay, so what if we didn't know this index number? Because we could be adding loads of things to the table when the game's running. Because when the game's running, we can't see the table for ourselves. So we don't know... And we can't predict, we can't guarantee that the players will be in a set index. We, we, we can't just say, oh yeah, well, this player is going to be at position 30. Because we're not going to know the index position of every player. And four loops is just what makes these tables so great. Because what a for loop does is it lets us loop through a table. Now we'll come back to this example in a bit but I'm going to now talk to you and explain what for loops are and why they are so useful. So a for loop is used so an in pairs loop here so there's two types of for loop um, your normal for loop which we'll be looking at in a future video and uh, the in pairs type which we're talking about today so the when, when I say for loop I'm talking about for IV in pairs and you've probably seen it before this is what it looks like so you've got your four I comma V in pairs then you've got a pair of brackets then you've got do on the end of that then you can drop a line and you've got your end in here so can look very confusing here but really it isn't okay it's, it's not confusing at all because when I explain this to you right now you're going to think oh yeah that's what it's for and it's all going to become clear so let's just create a table Let's have some things in there. All right, we've got quite a lot of, uh, quite a few different data types in here. We've got a string, numbers, and a boolean. So this is our table. Now, as I've said before, the for loop is going to loop through every object in the table, every item in the table. It's going to loop through, and every time it loops through the table, it will loop around. So if we've got what have we got here? We've got four items in the table. One, two, three, four. So the for loop is going to run four times. It's going to loop around 
four times. Just like a while loop will run forever as long as the condition is true. The for loop is going to run for as many objects you have. So it will loop around and it will perform some code. So if we had just a code to print hello in here, what would happen is because we've got four items in this table, it's going to print hello four times. If there were five items, it would print five times. Okay. So firstly, you have to put the name of your table in here so that the script knows what to loop through. So when we say loop through, it will run this code for each index. So it will go through, it will go to the first item and it will run whatever code is inside of which is in between these two lines. So in this case, it will run the print and it will run it. And then when it gets to the end, well, we're not at the end of our table yet. So we've now moved on to the second index, which is three. So we're just going to run the for loop again. And it's going to print hello again. So that's the second time now. Go to the end. Now we're going to move to the fourth index in the table. And it's going to print hello again. So now it's printed out three times. And then it's going to go to the false, which is still an item in the table. And it's going to print hello again. So the for in pairs loop is... Is, is repeating for as, for, the, for the same amount, well, the, the number of times it is repeating is the same as the number of items in the table. It's dependent on how many items there are in the table. So if there was just one item in the table, it would only run this code once, okay? So that's the very basics. The for in pairs loop will run code for the items in the table, depending on how many items are in that table. So once again, if there were two items in the table, it would only run this code twice. And I will prove that to you. Let's run this code and it should print hello four times. Now, let me just disable the other script so we don't get confused. You can see it has printed out hello four times like this. You can see the, the x4 times four, meaning that the same message is being printed four times. So just as I've said, the for loop is printing. It is running the code in between these two lines. The code inside of this for loop will run for as many items there are in the table. So four items means it will run four times. And again, if we were to add another piece of data into this table, so there are now five objects, you can see it has changed and it is running five times. It's printing five times. So that is crucial. You need to know that for your for loop. Now you might be thinking, well, this is a bit pointless. It's just running code a set number of times. How is that useful to me? And how is that useful to the table? And genuine concern that is. Um, but we haven't learned about what i is, what v is, and what this whole in pairs stuff means. Well, that's because a for loop doesn't just run code a set number of times based on how many items there are in a table. Because here comes the good stuff. And everybody's saying, well, what does the i mean? What does the v mean? And everybody's saying, well, I don't understand it because I'm, I keep seeing this i and v everywhere. But actually, you don't have to write i and v. You could write whatever you want. And firstly, though, I'm going to explain why we use i and v and, and what these things actually are. So we've said before that the for loop will loop around or run x times. And that x is going to be the, the amount of items in the table. So we've got five items now in the table. So this is going to run five times. And every time it does run or loop around, I've said that it's running for that index. So I said the first time round, it's going to be running for this hello. So it will be running the code that's inside this for loop for this index. Hello. So what's happening when it is running the code for this index is the I down here 
is our index value. Okay, now don't get confused by the word index because we have got index in the table and we've got index down here. So the, the table index value is its position, right? So this would be position one, this would be position two, this would be position three, this would be position four and position five. That's the table index. And it's basically the same thing. Every time this for loop runs for each item in the table, this i, it's a variable basically, and this variable holds the index of the current item. So the first time that this loops around, i is going to be equal to one because that is the index of the item that we are currently looping through. So on the first time around, the first pass, i is going to be one because that is the position in the table for this item. So what the for loop is doing it is running the code every time for a specific item in the table. And so we pass the index value, which is one in this case, to the for loop. And as it loops on, as the code finishes and we get to the end and we loop around, this index will change to the next position of the next object. Because once the code is executed for the first item in the table, I said it moves on to the next one, so it would move on to index number two. And the value of index number two is three. So i is now going to be two, because that is the index of the second item. And now you might have realized what this v means. The v stands for value. So just like the index is going to be the position value of the item that we're currently looping through, the V stands for value, the value of the item that we're currently looping through. So the value of that index. So let's imagine that we're on position, we're on index three. So we've looped around two times already, We've done the hello, we've done the three, and now the third item in the table is being looped through. So the i for index is three, because three is the position value or index of the third item in the table. But the value of index three, well, it's four, because the held value at the third position, so the value that is stored in the third position of the table, is four. So the value of index three, the value of the third position in the table, I'm trying to be as clear as I can, is four. So we're taking this four and we're making it the value of v. So just like a variable is a reference to something, the v here is a reference to the value of the current index, the current item of the table. So if we are on index three, then the value is gonna be four, okay? And if we just give ourselves another example here, let's say that we were on the first item, the first time that we're looping through, well, we're gonna start off with index one. So what happens is that uh, the i variable here has the, uh, index value of one and the v has because well, it is the, it's, it's the value variable that will hold reference or that will be equal to hello because that is the value stored at that position so in a table we have indexes and we have values the values are the actual pieces of data that are being stored so in this case hello or bye or any data could be true or false like we outlined in the tables video the V is that data. It's the value held at a certain position. So we have the index. So you could just write out index value because these are variables. They can take any name. It's just that they're called I and V because I is short for index, V is short for value. And when you're coding, 
you, you just want to be you, you want to make things short because you don't want to do loads of typing but it's up to you you could call it you know hamburger comma fries as long as you know that the first variable here is always going to be the index and the second one is going to be the value but we're just going to keep them at i and v because that's what everybody seems to be using nowadays so we've just made clear that the for loop this is a recap if you're not with us if you've lost us a little bit so we're going to go just back from the start query quickly so the for loop is used to loop through a table and when we say loop through we mean perform some code for each item in the table so it could just be a simple print and so any code in between these two lines is going to run a certain amount of times and the amount of times that it runs is determined by how many items are there are in the table so if there are three items then the code in between these two lines will run three times and every time that the for loop runs this code we call it like looping through so the first time it loops through we'll be looping through for hello the second time we will be looping through for buy and the third time we will be looping through for false now every time we loop through and we get to the end well we go back to the start and when we go back to the start here to this for line well the i value and the v value are updated to the current um, piece of data the current item that's being looped through so the first time round we will be on hello which is the first item in the table. So the we immediately enter the for loop and the script automatically, because we've told it to loop through my tab, it's automatically, uh, it's automatically got the index for us and the value. So if we were to print out what I was and we were to print out what V was, it would print out the position index, which would be one, and it would print out hello. Then it would get to the end, it would go to the top again, and we would now be on the second item in the table. So the i has been updated to 2 because it's the second position, and the v has been updated to by because by is the value held at that position. It's the data held at that index, okay? So we should get printed out for us 1 and then hello. Let's have a look and see if that happens. Brilliant. So we can see that it has printed out one, which is the index for hello, because don't forget, this is index one, this is index two, this is index three. So it's printed out the index for hello, which is one, then it's printed out V. And remember we said that V holds the value of that data, so that the data held in index one is hello, so that will be equal to V. So V has printed out hello then it's got to the end it's gone round again and it has updated the variables i and v to the index and value of the second item in the table so i is now 2 and v is now by as you can see it has then printed out the new i which is 2 then it's printed out the new v which is by and again, you can expect this part here. We go around again. I and V automatically are updated because we have moved on to the next item in the table, which is uh, the third index. So I is now three and V is going to be the value held at that index. So the data that is held at that index at the third position, which is a Boolean value, false. So it will print out three which is i and then we'll print out v which is false but what you can see here is that it is it is printing out the same things right sorry it's doing the same code for each thing in the table so for every single index in the table it is it is doing the same action too so it is printing its index and it's printing its value and it's doing that for everything in the table so another comment that i got was, well, how do we print everything in a table? Because you can't just go print my tab. You just can't do that. If you were to do that, if you were to print my tab, 
you would get an error. And, well, not an error, but it would print this out for you. It would print table and this memory location of where the table is at. That does nothing to help us. We can print out certain uh, indexes in a table, certain, you know, um, values, but we can't print out the entire table itself. And this is where for loops come in handy, because when we use a for loop, it is going to, whatever code we put in between these two lines here, is going to be applied, it's going to be executed for every item in the table. You can guarantee that because it is looping through the entire table. So for every item in the table, we are going to run this code. And we've also got references. We've got, we're able to access the current index and its value. So we can basically perform any action to the table. So if you want to print the table, well, okay, we're not actually printing the entire table. We're being a bit crafty and we're printing out the index and value of each item in the table. So it's not like you're you're saying to the script, can you print me the, the whole table? You actually it's it's like it's going item by item and it's printing out each thing in the table. Now that sounds really confusing, but you can't just expect the script to print out this in brackets with commas. So what you're doing is you're actually using this for loop to access each item in the table. You're basically printing its value, and then you're moving on to the next one, printing out its value, moving on to the next one. So you have printed out the table, but you've not actually printed out the table by just doing one piece of code because you're actually printing each index and each value over and over again using this for loop. You're not actually like you would print a variable. You can't just say print my tab like this. You have to use a for loop and the for loop is printing each sub item of the table. But because you're printing every sub item, yeah, you're, you're printing the whole contents of the table. So the for loop is repeating code for each item in the table. So if I wanted to, um, let me think of a good example here. If I had a table full of um, numbers, right, and halfway through the game, I want to give everybody double points. Okay, so just imagine this is a table of everybody's points in the game. If I wanted to give everybody double points, I wanted to increase their points um, by by double. I want to double their scores. If I wasn't using a for loop, I would have to go, right, my tab one equals my tab one times two. Uh, my tab 2 equals my tab 2 times 2. And you can see this is getting very long. And if I have to do it for every single one in the table, it's going to be like this. It's, you know, it's going to be really long. And I have to update every single one with the index of the table. And it's not good. It takes too long. Too long to write. If something goes wrong, if there's an error and I've made a typo, I'm going to have to go back and update every single line, and then later on, if I want to change this, I have to change it all. It's just not a good way of handling it. But there's a better way, for loop, because we know the for loop is going to loop through every single item in the table. So whatever we do to one will be done to all. So if I was to, if I wanted to double every value in this table, well, because the for loop loops through every item in the table, surely I could just say if v is the value held for each item, for each index. So v is basically the data in the table. So for the first index, right, v is going to be 1. For the second index, v is going to be 2 because that's the value held. So I could just say, surely, v equals v times 2. Surely that would work. Let's have a look. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out um, a p 
piece of data from the table just to show you. So we'll do the second index because that's two for now. So we'll print that out. Then we'll do the for loop, which is going to just come along and um, double everything. And then we'll print it again and see the change that it has had. So we'll do a, we'll do a little wait as well. Wait two. So what's going to happen is we're going to print out the second index, which is currently two. We are then going to run our for loop, which is going to hopefully double everything in the table. And then we're going to print out the value of index two again. And hopefully it should be four. Let's have a look, see what happens. So it's two, but then the for loop comes along and it's still two. Hmm. So what's gone wrong here? Let's have a look. So um, we have doubled the value, but we need to write it to the table. So let's say my tab I. Let's try this again. Perfect. Okay. Now you may be wondering, well, what have you done here? What I have done is we have gone to the table. So we've gone up to the table just like we have here. And I've indexed, I've gone to the, the value of the index we're currently on. So if we're on, if we're on the second index here, we're looking up the table, we are then putting in the current index. So if we're running for the second time, we'd be on index two. So we've now accessed this value and we're setting it to two times the current value. So because V is a variable and it's, it's, it's just a variable that holds the value currently stored here. So it's not actually a direct link to the, to that um, piece of data in the table. It's kind of like a copy. It just holds the same value that's held at the second, uh, at the second value, sorry, at the second, because it's a two, right? If you were just to put two in here, two equals V times two, it's not going to do anything because we're not actually telling it it's not actually a, a location in the table, it's just a number, so we can't set that number to something else. Very confusing, I know. Um, but what I'm saying is, you can't just say, it, well, if you just say two here, the script doesn't really know what to update and it's not gonna save. But if you look up in the table and the index is gonna be the i value, cause it's gonna be like two or th two, if we're on the second item, we are looking up the table at that index and we can then set the value of that index to whatever its current value is times by two. So again, let's just show you it was two and now it's four. Okay. So what we've done is this code has executed itself 10 times for each item in the table. So when we first got into the for loop when we first started, i was one and v was one as well because it's the value stored and it's the same as the index because we're counting up to 10. But we located it in the table using its i, its index, just like we did here. So we grabbed that reference to it in the table and we said, okay, you see this here? We want this to be equal to its current value because v holds the value multiplied by two. So that would now be two. Then it moved on to the second index, which is two. And it said, okay, so we're gonna look up in the table, the second item, because I is now two, and we've got that item. And we've said, I want to set this to V. So that's gonna be two, which is the current number. So two times two is four. So I want to set this to four and it's done it. Then it would go to three and I would now be three. V would also be three because that's the data held at that position. It just so happens that they're both the same because they're both counting up um, one to 10. So we're looking it up in the, in the table and then we're basically doubling it here because V holds the number that is, that is stored. So three, three times two is six. And it would keep going on and on and on until the whole table is doubled. And when it gets to 10 and it doubles it and it makes it 20 and this line has completed, we would finish because we've got to the end of the table. And then it prints out the new value of the second index, which we've asked it to do. So I know that will be quite confusing as well. And that, that error that, well, not error, but where it, it actually didn't double. Don't worry too much about that. But what you need to know 
is that the for loop will run um, for however many things there are in the table. So if there's 10 items, it will run 10 times. If there's one item, it will only run once. And every time it loops around again and it gets to the end, if there is another item in the table, then its index value will be updated to the index of that of that uh, new item that we've moved on to, and the V will be its value. So the value stored at that index. So basically the data which is in that position. So the in pair stuff, this is all syntax. This is what we need to write to tell the script that yes, we want to do a for loop. We want to loop through one by one through this table. So you can see now why I was talking about the tables and why the tables are so important. And again, if you haven't checked out the video on tables, please do go ahead and check that out because it will be a massive help to you. And um, tables, they are used all the time in in Roblox for, for all sorts of things. Let's go ahead and give a practical example here. Okay, so the example that I'm going to give you is a bit similar to something that you might have seen in a game such as Jailbreak or another town and city game. So let's imagine that these are these squares here uh, are buildings in a game, okay? And um, in fact, let's make them a bit bigger so they actually look like buildings. There we go. So let's imagine that these are all buildings and when it gets to night time in the game, um, so it's really dark, they get, you know, it's quite hard to see them, especially if you're far away. Um, so what if we wanted to turn them all on at night? Well, what you would obviously do is you would go uh, game dot workspace dot building, you know, dot um, and to turn them on, I'm going to set their material to neon. OK, that way they'll be nice and bright. But what you'd have to do is first, we've got what, I don't know, 20, 20 buildings. So you'd have to repeat the same code over and over again, 20 times. And if you wanted to change the material in future, maybe, you'd have to go all the way back and change all the materials one by one. And when you have code to turn them on in the day and code to turn them off at night, then you're going to have double the amount of code. So that's 40 lines of code. And what if I told you we could use a for loop to loop through every single building and just quickly change them all at once? I'd only have to write one line of code to update the material property, and then the script would apply that for every single building. Well, firstly, the buildings need to be in a table because we know that in pairs loops only loop through tables. That's the whole point of them. So we need to somehow put them in table form. So how do we do this? Well, you'll be pleased to know that Roblox actually does this for you. Now, remember that in a table, we can have objects. Objects are a data type. So let's, for example, let me just show you. We could have an object in the table like this. And we could have multiple objects in a table as well. We could have game.workspace.baseplate. We could have game.workspace.terrain. We can have any objects in a table. Now, the good news is that there's a really quick way of getting objects in a table. Now, in this case, what I've done is I've gone ahead and put them all into a folder because that is the sensible thing to do. So I'm going to call this folder buildings. And that way, it just contains all the buildings, nothing else. So we know that everything in this folder is going to be a building. So what you can do is, firstly, let's create a variable. And I'm just going to call the variable buildings table. Now, instead of creating a table like this, I'm going to use a method called get children. So I'm going to firstly reference my folder, game.workspace.buildings. But then I can say colon, and you can see all these methods come up, inbuilt functions. Uh, I've got a video on inbuilt functions. You should have already seen it. It's earlier on in the series, really, really useful. But um, the inbuilt function that we're going to be using today is get children. And what get children does is if you don't know what a child is in Roblox scripting context, a child is something inside of an object. So this building is the child of the folder because it is inside of the folder. So when we're saying get children, we're asking the script to get all of the objects that are inside of this folder called buildings. And it's going to return them all to us in table form. So we should get something returned to us like this. 
we should have a table with all of these different buildings in. But because there's lots and lots of buildings, we don't want to have to spend the time looking through them all. And so get children will basically take all of these building parts, put them in one big table, and it will now be, we can now just, you know, we can reference it, we can, we can easily uh, now use it because it's this variable, we've got it stored in this variable. So buildings table is now a table full of objects of all these buildings. So now we can use our for loop to loop through each one. So we say for i comma v in pairs, put the buildings table in here like that. And then we say do, drop a line. And now the index and values will automatically update when the script runs. So we don't need to pay attention to the index values because we have no use for them here. All we need is the value. And so the value of each index is going to be that object. So it's a direct reference to each building in the folder. Because if we think about it, our buildings table will actually look like this. Won't it? It will be game dot workspace dot buildings dot building. And we'll have lots of these. So, you know, we'll have 20 or so of these. So the same principle applies. It will have index one here, index two here, and there will be loads and loads of indexes. So we've probably got 20 buildings at least. So at least 20 index values. So 20 items at least in the table. So that will be 20 or, or more indexes. But um, the we don't need to pay attention to the indexes. We, we could print them out and it would print out 1 to 20 basically. But we're interested in the value, the actual data here. The data, the value, same thing. But uh, the value for each item will be the path to that part basically. So that object. So we can now do whatever we like with that object. If we wanted to delete them all, we could say v colon destroy, just like you would usually do on a part or an object. And guess what? It will delete all of the buildings. And if you don't believe me, just watch. Don't believe me, just watch. There you go, it's gone. And if we look in the workspace, the buildings folder has got nothing inside of it because they've all been deleted. So what happened was the script basically looped through every single building. Now, if you slowed it down to, you know, fractional seconds, even quicker than that, because the script runs so quickly. If you did slow it down to a point where it is slow enough to see this happening, you would see one building go, then the next one would go. And to prove this to you further, if I added a wait here of, say, one second, because it's destroying a building, but then it's delaying the script by one second. So we're not going to move on to the next building until these, this one second is up. So if you watch, we've slowed it down here, but you can see that blocks are disappearing every second. Because once that one second's up, it's moving on to the next building in a table, and it's removing that. And then that one's getting removed, and eventually you will run out of blocks. So this is essentially a slowed down version of what we've just seen. But by the time that the game had started, well, they'd already been deleted because the script runs that fast. So just keep watching and they'll all get uh, destroyed. There we go. So they all got deleted. And again, if we were to get rid of this weight, they would just all be gone instantly. So there you go. So what we want to do here is actually turn, turn the buildings on. We, we want to make them bright and shining. So we could just say um, V because the, the the value variable here is referencing e the, the object. So it will, you know, eventually reference all parts. It will do the same thing to all of the building parts. So we can just change their material property to neon. And that's going to do it. And we can do a little print as well, just to show you that it happened a load of time. So we can say material updated for index and we can then do dot dot you can concatenate the the string and you can print out these values as well you could print out the i and v values if you ever need to debug or test or you want to make sure that it worked you can print it out and 
this will now print out material updated and it will print out every index value so it should print out 1 to 20 or even more so let's check it out so there we go and it's done it and they've they've all gone neon so you can see it updated it for the first one then it moved on to the second one then the third one fourth fifth sixth seventh all the way up to it well, even over 20 so the 31 um blocks here so it updated the material 31 times because there are 31 blocks if you don't believe me pause the video count them all up i guarantee you a million robux that there are 31 objects and you can see after 31 it stopped so as i said earlier it will only run for the number of items you have in the table so there's obviously 31 bricks buildings here so that means 31 items in the table which means the for loop is going to run 31 times no more no less so there you go let's conclude the video here i think we've gone through quite a lot and uh, a quick recap so a for loop is a loop which will loop through every object in a table so if you've got 10 items in a table, the for loop will run 10 times. If you've got one item, it will only run once. But essentially, you can perform code, you can run code for a set number of times based on how many things are in your table. And if you want, you can access that specific item or index, well, that index in the table. Um, based on the i and v values. So if you wanted to change everything in the table, then you could update every index by using the v here. And because it's in the for loop, the same code will be applied to everything in the table. So if you change the material of v to neon, you're basically changing the material of every part in the folder because that part is in your table and you're looping through everything in your table and you're basically any code that you go in here will it's you're not actually you're not updating the material of one thing you're updating the material of everything in your table but it's just updating one by one because as we saw earlier if we were to add a weight in here and essentially slow down the script this is what it would look like so you can see it's going through the table we're on now on the fourth one, it's made neon, now the fifth, now the sixth, seventh, eighth, you know, ninth. You can see it's printing out as well, that it's now updated it for index 11. But every time that you loop through and you get to the end, it is updating the i value, the index, to the next index, the next item in the table. Because when it's finished with this one, it's moving on to the next one. And it's not going to stop until you reach the end of the table, which it is about to do with the final block. And it makes it neon, and then it stops printing and it will end the for loop. And if you were to print something at the end here, saying reach the end, just to show that we have actually got out of this for loop, finally. And let's just change this weight because we don't want to wait here all day. Let's make it 10 times faster. So it goes along and when it reaches the end, it says it prints out. So we now know that it, when it finishes, when the for loop is done, when it's got, when it's basically performed the code here for every item in the table, it's going to print out this message here because it is moving on to the next instruction in the code. So unlike a while loop, it's not going to run forever based on a condition, which a while loop can do. A while loop can run forever. This for loop is only going to run for the items in your table and it's going to perform code going to perform an action to each item in your table based on what you've put here so what you write in here will be done to everything in your table and that is four loops now people do think they are confusing but really they are not it's just a quick way of looping through things if you have you know if you want to quickly loop through all the players in your game that's another way it can be used you can give everybody 10 coins because you can just loop through everyone in the game so if you wanted to loop through everyone in the game, you could say for IV in pairs and then game dot players and a bit like get children, there's an inbuilt function to get all the players in the game. It's called get players 
don't forget you need these two brackets on the end as well because it's a function that we're essentially calling or a method and just like get children get players will return back to us a table of all the players in their game in the game so they're player objects so it could be like alvin underscore blocks or newt um so it will return back objects of players currently in the game so only currently in that game server and then that way you could loop through all the players so if you had that table again let's just um make this table here so we will still have our indexes so the first time it loops around let's imagine i was first in the table then one would be the value of i because that's my position in the table and then v would be this object path so it would be game.players.alvinblocks so if i wanted to kick alvin blocks out of the game i could say v colon kick and that would kick me from the game then we would reach the end and we would go back to the start because we've still got another object in the table so i would now update to two because that is the second index here and the v the value would update to be the path or the the uh, reference to newt in the uh, in the game here because it's the object so game.players.newt so it would be the same as saying game.players.newt colon kick he would get kicked as well then we would reach the end and we'd be finished. So let's check this out. Let's do a little wait here. Wait five, just so we can get into the game. Let's play. And after five seconds, we should hopefully be kicked. There we go, you were kicked from this game. So what happens is it would kick everybody out of the game. But you can see how it is performing, it would perform the action for every player in the game because everybody Everybody would be in that table because the game has created the table, it's given it us, and everybody who's currently in the game would be in that table, and because a for loop applies the same code to every index in the table, everybody would get kicked. So that is what a for loop is, but you can also do some checking. So if you only wanted a certain player to get kicked, so for example, if we had um, loads of players in the game, but I only wanted to kick a player if they had i don't know um if they had let me think okay i've got an example so if the player was um a, a new player for example so let's say um v dot account age is um less than 15 so if they're less than if their account is less than 15 days old then i could kick them now because this is the player object each player object has a property called account age. So we could check every player's account age because this is going to run for everybody. So for each player, we would check their account age. And if it is under 15 days, then we would kick them. But obviously not every player is going to be under 15 days old. So for some players, we would get this if statement. Well, and that would not be true. So we would not run this code. We would just move on to the next player. But if somebody joined who was under 15 days old, we would kick them. Now, I'm going to change this to 99999 and run this, and we'll see if I get kicked. Okay, I did get kicked. Because obviously I haven't been on Roblox for uh, that length of time, for very, very long. But if I changed it to 15 days, obviously I've been on Roblox for more than 15 days, so it won't kick me. Now let's run this again. And it's, it's a pretty bad, bad example, to be honest, because there's only one player in the game. But if you had a full server of people and then you suddenly ran that code, it would kick quite a few people out, probably. So you can see I didn't get kicked here. But a for loop will loop through everything in, the, in, in a table. So because game.players colon get players is a table of, of everyone in the game, it, it is... Uh, a for loop is a good way of, of looping through players. So examples include if you want to give everybody in the game 10 cash or you know, if you want to give them uh, money at the end of a round, a for loop is great. If you want to teleport every player in your game to a certain location, a for loop is great because you could be like um, v.character.alvin.blocks 
um, humanoid root part dot c frame equals vector three dot new. Um, if you don't know what this means, when you say dot character on a player object, it's getting their their character. And when you say humanoid root part dot c frame, when you move their humanoid root part, you're moving a player basically. So the humanoid root part is a central part in the player. When you move that. The whole body moves with it so it's like teleporting a player to a certain location so if i was to just get a position over here let's just put this get this position if i was to put this position in here what would happen is it would teleport all the players into the game in that sorry in that game to this position here which is at the end of the map and if we had a full server of people which we will uh, we will assemble that right now. Let's uh, load up a server of people. Whoops, and my bad. This needs to be a C frame, not a vector three. Um, in fact, we can just say position because we haven't learned about C frames yet. My apologies. So if I just if I publish this game, I get loads of people in it. You should expect everybody to be teleported to the side of the map. Okay, so here we are in game with a few people that have joined me, and we've got a countdown in the. Uh, bottom left corner of when the uh, for loop is going to start and hopefully it teleports everybody to the end of the map so what's going to happen is it's going to get that table of players the game is going to give us that table which we have put in the for loop game.players colon get players and it's going to loop through every single player and teleport them one by one but it's going to happen so quickly that it's going to look like everybody gets teleported at the same time so three two one now the for loop is going to run and boom we all get teleported to the end of the the map so there you go that is what a for loop is a for loop loops through a table and it runs code on each item in that table now it doesn't have to perform it doesn't have to run code that changes that table it could just print out a message like i showed you at the start but we can also use those i and v values index and value we can use them to edit the table or to do things with the table's data so in this case we are changing we are using the data in that table so the player's object which we've gotten from the table each item and we are moving the player's characters so we're using that data from the table but you could also increment a player's cash value which is in their player by using the game colon get players thing um, also you can use it to change properties of you know, different objects like bricks, like we changed the property of the material. We also deleted the bricks. So a for loop can be used for anything, really, if you're looping through lots of things at once. And if you want to change lots of things at once, you can use a for loop and it will make the code more efficient because you haven't got loads and loads of lines which are doing the same thing for just different objects. Because you put all those objects in a table, you either create the table yourself or you use something like get children or get players to give you that generated table which the game makes and we make use of those inbuilt functions like get children and get players which will return that table to us and we use those tables we loop through them and we're able to do things with 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 those tables and we can edit them and we can edit we can edit the tables we can edit their values we can use the values to access different things so very very useful stuff and it is something that you will be using a lot in roblox so it's one of the most important things you need to know just like if statements just like functions one of those things you're going to use all the time you can't expect to be able to script a game without using for loops now if you are still confused please do put comments in the description i will most likely be making a follow-up video from this one where i answer your questions we might do a bit more on them in the future but this is all you need to know really this is pretty much what anybody um, who scripts needs to know about a for loop um, and how to use them because you're not going to get any more advanced than that we're, we're over the hardest stuff and uh, it probably was easier than you thought it would be because everybody gets confused by those i v values and what's the brackets for why why are we using tables so again it's very important you learn those tables watch the previous video on tables very very useful video and i do recommend you check it out and uh, well done as well if you've reached the end here because uh, 55 minutes very very long for a video but i know you guys 
do like the content when you get a nice long video. I know you guys like to, to watch those, so I like making them as well. So any questions you have, put them in the description. Do try searching up on the internet as well for for loops because uh, uh, there's a lot of helpful stuff out there as well. And uh, if you look on the Roblox website, Roblox uh, Developer Hub as well, there's some good examples. I might link those in the description as well. Anyway, thank you for watching. Do subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Do like the video if you want to see more of them. Again, leave comments with any questions. And uh, you can click the Alvin Blocks logo in the middle of your screen. Subscribe. You can also check out the rest of the series. The thumbnail should be on screen now. Thank you for watching. Cheers. Bye.